Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on your side starts now. Welcome to Tennessee This Week. We're going to get started by talking to our panel of pundits because there is definitely a lot to talk about. With us today, Michael Covington, our industrial consultant, with Craig Griffith, of course, he's here every week, our healthcare analyst, and Shelly Breeding, our legal expert today. Let's start with this Vanderbilt poll because they did cover a lot of topics, a lot of hot topics in uh, Tennessee right now. Governor Lee's executive order, the 72-hour waiting period, 82% of the people polled said that they support this in general. But the other one, the red flag law, which people are going back and forth on, shows that 72% of registered voters also supported a red flag law to prevent general gun-related violence. Does this poll change how lawmakers approach this when they have a special session or maybe down the road next year? And Craig, we'll start with you. Well, no, I don't think it'll change any opinion at all. I think that this poll mirrors pretty much what we've been seeing in polls nationally, that there's a desire amongst a majority, three quarters, 80% of the, of the people of the country to do do something about gun violence. They want people to come up with a plan that they will be safe, their children will be safe in school, they'll be safe going to a hospital waiting room, they'll be safe going to a grocery store, safe going to a uh, your church or synagogue. I think people want some action taken. And of course, you know, everyone talks about, uh, well, it's a mental health issue. And and I, I couldn't agree more, it is. Uh, there are 48,000 homicides by gun in this country a year, and half of those, 24,000, are suicides. So that's indicating a severe mental health crisis. So if the state legislature in Tennessee doesn't see fit to come back to do a red flag law or something akin to a red flag law, then they should come back into session to take up mental health issues. There is increased money in the budget this year for mental health services, but yet across the state, that's that's going to result in 108 new treatment beds, which isn't going to scratch the surface of what we need in terms of mental health. So I think that people want some action taken, and this poll clearly shows that that where the action should be. And Shelley, you, you, your response to that, are you with that poll? Do you think that the lawmakers will follow what the people are saying, or do you think we're going to get the same as we did this year? I mean, I agree with Craig. Unfortunately, I think that the legislature in Tennessee is just tone deaf to what their constituents want. Clearly, the vast majority of Tennesseans want some sort of red flag law, want these background checks. And then the legislature seems to just ignore this. And they act as though we don't have any laws that deprive Tennesseans of their gun rights. And they want to rely on the Second Amendment. I fully support the Second Amendment. But there are instances that people need to have their gun taken away for a short period of time if they have mental health issues. Currently, there are orders of protection issued every day. And if there's an order of protection against someone, they cannot have a firearm. Um, there are other laws that are similar to this. This is not a new concept under the law in Tennessee. There has to be good cause shown. Under a red flag law, it would be temporary. And then the person who has the rights temporarily taken away would have their due process hearing in court as to what this brought up and, and be able to get their guns back if they need to. But we have to do something. You know, when, when this shooting happened in Nashville last month, I talked to my eight-year-old son about it for the first time. And then the next week, his school was on a lockdown because there was a random person on campus. You know, as a parent, and I think this is where most Tennesseans are, we are begging the legislature to do something, and they're simply not doing anything. Uh, but no, I'm not hopeful that they're going to listen to eight out of 10 voters who want to see these laws passed um, and they can't seem to get it together. And this is bipartisan. This is not one side or another. This is across the board and they need to listen, but I'm not hopeful that they will. And Michael? Well, first of all, I think the session, the legislative session ended too soon. I think they should have stuck around at least long enough to have a, a, a good, thoughtful discussion about it. That's first of all. Second, there's there's no need to rush this. We need to make sure that we put some thought into what it is that will actually work, whether it's a red flag law, 72 hours, uh, orders of protection, whatever it is that would stop the kind of thing that happened at Covenant is what we should do. And if, we, if it takes some time, we need to take the time. 
it's rushing to do it because of, of uh, the, the session needing to end or because of polls that indicate uh, uh, Tennesseans' desire for something to be done. Do something, but do it thoughtfully. Well, and, and real quickly, I know that they're going to work on that, and we're, we're, you're talking about it and your your opinions about it. What about the idea of having an, someone armed at every school until we get something else done? And just go around the horn again real quickly. Craig? Well, the governor provided for SROs, officers, in a supplemental budget line item uh, after the Covenant uh, shooting. So supposedly in every public and private school uh, in the state, there will be right. an officer uh, protecting the, the students, the staff. But there's been school shootings where there's been, you know, armed officers on campus. It's not an end all to stop school shootings. So uh, it's it's one of the things that in a short term, you know, th that that would help students have some comfort where they are, but you know we don't want to create this prison-like atmosphere on our on our um, school campuses across the state, and I and I think people are asking for action because you know there seems to be a mass shooting, certainly every week, almost several times a week. So I think that's why there's an impetus by people wanting to have some action taken because of the frequency of of these uh, mass murders that are going on. So it's, you know, it's, there is no easy solution. That, that's for sure. I think if there was, we would have come up with it already. Right. But I think that they do need to take some action. Something, something needs to be done so that we uh, come up with a plan, as I said, to keep kids safe in schools, people safe in hospitals and waiting rooms and in churches and synagogues, supermarkets. So, you know, let, let's, let's take it. And, I would agree with uh, Michael in the terms of, no, they shouldn't have gone home. They should have addressed this issue. Right. But there were other things going on in the legislature that prompted their hasty retreat right. from the bench bill. Who, who, knows, who knows how those conversations would have went. Plate. Yeah, who, who knows how it would have went if they would have stayed there because there was a lot of emotion going on. But real quickly, right. having officers, armed officers, until we get something else, Shelly and then Michael. You know, there was that, that saying, I want to say it was Desmond Tutu, and I'm probably getting it wrong, but there's a saying about we have to stop just pulling bodies from the river. We have to go upstream and figure out why they're going into the river. You know, having SROs at schools, that's, I mean, that's one thing, but they're only there to stop after the shooting begins. Um, we need to address how to stop the shootings from happening to begin with. Um, and it doesn't address that. And, you know, the fact that there could be an armed SRO at my kid's school Okay, that's one thing. If there's a shooting, maybe it stops sooner, but it doesn't stop the shooting from from beginning and starting. And, and I think we need to focus on the cause of how these shootings are starting and keeping them from ever beginning instead of just being able to end them more quickly. Michael. I absolutely believe that uh, for the short term, at least, for the short term, having a... a uh, an enhanced SRO presence on campuses will make parents and students feel safer. If we get to a point, as Shelley's saying, to, to be able to stop things before they happen, I'm all for taking one or more of the SROs that, that, that we would put in schools, taking them out. But for the time being, and, and while uh, nerves and, and, and uh, tensions are very high. It would be good if we could to get those SRO officers into schools and at least make parents and, and their children feel safer. Yeah, and and who knows? And I mean, I don't have research on it. I used to be a police officer. I worked with SROs. I worked in schools. And who knows? SROs aren't, aren't going to end everything, but how many things haven't happened because they're there and because they're interacting with some of those students who, who might have become shooters. So so you just you don't don't ever know. All right, that that's not our first block, so to speak, but we're gonna get into some more issues from that Vanderbilt survey, including LGBTQ issues right after this break. And welcome back to Tennessee this week. Going back to the Vanderbilt survey that we've been talking about, it said that voters support bans on adult cabaret entertainment in public squares, public places, at the rate of basically two to one, 63% to 35%. Uh, that law is being challenged, though. Does that law get overruled by the courts? 
or do they get to actually stick with what lawmakers said and what apparently the majority of Tennesseans want? Michael, we'll start with you. You know, I'm not sure how well this law was written to start with. Um, I understand the, the the purpose for it, but I don't know how well it's written. So I'm not certain that it would stand up to the scrutiny of um, a legal challenge. Um, and I'd kind of like to see that happen, to see if the law has been written in such a way that it will effectively do what the voters really want it to do. But um, it, it may be an overreach. Shelley? Yes, I mean, I think the state has to show that there's a compelling interest because I, I think the challenge is part of it's going to be free speech. Um, and what the state's compelling interest is in prohibiting these performances, um, I, I don't know how it's going to play out in the courts. And I think it, part of that, like most cases, is going to depend on which court that it's in and, and how the lawyers brief the case. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch unfold. And I'm, I'm like, Michael, I'm not sure that it's written in such a way that it's going to be upheld. But we'll certainly keep an eye on it and see how it goes uh, through the court system. And Craig? Well, you know, for my time when I worked with the city of Knoxville, you couldn't have an adult show, whatever right. that is defined, in public to begin right. with. I mean, there already were laws against that sort of uh, uh, performances, and I'm not really sure how this law enhances that in, in you know, uh, if it was an adult, you know, if there was nudity or simulated sexual activity, that was already illegal. You couldn't do that in the city of Knoxville and in the Col Coliseum or the World's Fair Park. So, you know, I don't know what new ground this law is breaking, but, uh, you know, it's just an, uh, an effort by some of our legislators to show they're right on top of it. They're going to stop it. Yeah, I, I, I often wonder because I when it was all going on, I'm thinking, well, yeah, if you had like a topless show on a main street, you're going to get shut down. I mean, right. at I least mean, that are, even before that was already on the books. So, right. you know, I'm not I, I think they were just trying to make a point. Yeah. OK, well, the, part of that survey, they asked one question. Would you oppose uh, legislation that restricted transgender individuals access to health care and 66 percent? would oppose the restrictions, I guess, the way, I'm, I'm curious is how they asked that question, because in another poll done in January was about double this, the people that were in the Vanderbilt poll, they asked it a different way, saying, would you support or not support gender reassignment surgery for those under the age of 18? And 61% said they would oppose it. So the Vanderbilt survey, I'm, I'm curious what you think about how they ask questions, because they're not necessarily showing us or revealing exactly how they ask those questions. Are we getting accurate numbers there? Do you think in these well, after a number number of years in politics, it's all about how you ask the question, uh, and you'll you'll see the different polling firms poll well for Democrats, other polling firms poll well for Republicans because it's the way they phrase the question. So you have to take all these polls with a grain of salt in the sense that you know they 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 how they ask the question is going to influence the answer. Um, you know, and that's why the polls in most recent presidential elections haven't been all that accurate. So uh, there's a lot of polling that goes on and that's, uh, you know, do you poll all the registered voters? Do you poll likely voters? Do you poll all citizens? And you're going to get a different result when you do each one of those categories. So, but getting getting back to the question of, of medical aid, I, these are decisions that should be made between people and their doctors, not between their doctors, their state representative, and and the citizens. Uh, they're, they're accepted protocols for addressing mental health issues, for uh, addressing um, LGBTQ trans issues it, it, that have been adopted by national, you know, recognized medical organizations. And I think that those are the people, you know, the family, the doctor, and the individual that need to be making the decisions, not the state representatives. So we could ask either one of you, Michael or Shelley, your just your view of how these polls ask questions or get right into that issue. Uh, is this something that the majority seem to think that 18 and under is too young to be making those drastic of decisions? But should we step aside as, uh, you know, and let the medical and the family and the children make those decisions? Well, we sh certainly shouldn't be letting the children make these kinds of life altering decisions number one number two i've i've had i've been surveyed um on this subject matter and i questioned the surveyor um enough that the survey was able to tell me i can't answer that question for you sir 
I can't tell you why we're asking you these questions in the way that we're asking them. In some instances, th this is about uh, uh, children making decisions so that they can compete in sports. I don't know that at the, at the Tennessee legislature's uh, consideration uh, whether it's about that or not. If you're trying to restrict um, a young person from being able to, to um, have a surgery that would allow them to compete as a different sex, uh, that's, that becomes a, a, a much more convoluted issue, and I think it needs to be better defined, certainly before our legislature starts to take action on it. So, uh, again, th th there's no rush on this, and I don't think that, um, that there's an emergency that needs, that, that needs to be dealt with that prompts them to have to make this decision now. Shall we? I, mean, I just don't think that this is a huge issue in Tennessee, that there's all these parents who are asking for their children's gender to be reassigned by surgery, have surgery for that to compete in sports. I just, I don't think that that's a huge issue in Tennessee. And I think this is a very personal decision for a lot of children. You know, some children are born with both sex organs. And it's a very personal decision that is a family decision with their doctor. And as Craig said, there are very specific medical guidelines for this. Certainly no children are making this decision without their parents signing off on it, um, their parent or their guardian. Um, I just think this is a personal case-by-case -case basis. The doctor has to decide what is best. You know, is this a medical uh, necessity? Is the doctor um, advising the parents to do this in this situation with this particular child, given that child's health history um, and their genetics and what is what is going on in each of right. these cases. I just don't think that the legislature should be be butting in on the family decisions. They, they shouldn't be restricting it. And that's what this poll shows, is that the legislature should not be restricting that and making these family personal choices. Well, the other issue we want to get into was, again, part of this poll. It dealt with abortion. We're going to find out, you know, lawmakers out of step with what people want. We'll be talking to our panel of pundits when we come back with that as well. Tennessee this week, as part of the Vanderbilt poll, they talked about abortion. 82% of registered voters in Tennessee think that it should be legal in Tennessee if it would prevent the death or serious risk of health for the mother. However, a majority, 65% of people in Tennessee think abortion should be illegal after 15 weeks. Are our lawmakers out of step with what voters want? Shelley? Absolutely, they are out of step. Um, you know, Tennesseans show across the board there should be exceptions for the life of the mother, the life of the child. And again, like you just said, most Tennesseans are supporting it before 15 weeks. But then also the poll also showed that the vast majority show but believe that it should never be a crime uh, and that people should be charged as a crime, which is the way that the law is currently written is that any medical doctor who performs an abortion is guilty of a crime and can be charged. Um, so I think that they're way out of line with what Tennesseans want here. Michael? Well, uh, I, I was under the impression that um, the the criminal aspect of abortion for doctors was if right. there was not another doctor that would concur with the opinion that the mother's life was in jeopardy. No, um, that's not it. That's not okay. it. <laughs> well, I, I I have a problem. I have a problem with the with the strict with the strict nature of of the law as it's written, as I'm understanding it. So I think that this should be. Um, a loosening of that restriction on uh, who can have an abortion, whether whether rape and, and incest would be considered reasons to have an abortion without having a, a second doctor uh, uh, opine on whether or not it should happen or not. Um, beyond that, uh, it's a restrictive law, it, and it may it may just possibly be over the top. And Craig, yes, well, I. I... Clearly, clearly, the poll shows that the legislature is not where the majority of the, uh, the legislatures are. They took very little action this session on that. Uh, there were a number of bills up, and they wound up adopting an, an exception for two types of pregnancies that are uh, like 0.01% occurrence. Right. So they really didn't change the law at all. 
and there's this whole issue of penalizing uh, the, the the medical doctors. And I'll I'll just get back to what I said about the the trans treatment. This is a decision again that should be between you know the woman and her doctor. Uh, there shouldn't be a politician in that examination room inserting him or herself in that decision. Uh, the, these aren't necessarily just you know birth control abortions. Uh, oops, I made a mistake. I need to get this taken care of. There are serious medical issues involved in, in, a, in a number of difficult pregnancies that need to be addressed by the woman, her family, and the doctor. And and, and I think what happened is that affirmative defense was taken out this session, but we'll move on from that topic. We only have about three and a half minutes left here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Knoxville, uh, the budget, the mayor. Mayor uh, India Kincannon outlined a budget, talked about spending $26 million on uh, the Western Heights neighborhood and maybe 200 total with public and private money to change transportation, find arts center. The high point that I'm most proud of is that we're in great fiscal situation. Uh, we're not raising taxes. We are paying our police officers, firefighters, and city workers fair competitive wages. And we're making great new investments in great spaces in our city. I think this this budget year has been pretty smooth sailing. You know, we uh, we have a strong uh, strong fiscal situation. Knoxville's growing. People want to move here. I think our biggest challenge as a community is just housing, and this budget supports uh, more affordable housing and also uh, helps people who want to build private sector housing because we're going to add more people to. We have 3,800 housing units in the process of being built in Knoxville right now. And we need more people to be able to process those permits and applications in an expeditious, fair, and transparent manner. You, you guys heard about her budget. She revealed it. Uh, your take on what she wants to spend money on. Yeah, I mean, I well, think it's... she's looking at, I'm sorry. I think Go she's ahead. looking at affordable housing, which is one of the, the biggest needs that our city has. Uh, and she's looking at affordable housing and, and trying to address that. Um, which to me, that infrastructure, you know, things in East Knoxville for, um, I think I forgot what she called it over there, some sort of facility in East Knoxville to bring in. I, I mean, those are the things that we need to keep people here. But affordable housing, I think, is the top of the list. That's the top of the list of her budget. Right. Yeah, well, I was just at a groundbreaking on a project by uh, the City and Volunteer Ministry Center that put 48 new affordable housing uh, beds in, right. into the city, which is, you know, a great step forward, but doesn't anywhere meet the demand that we have. And KCDC is transforming Western Heights and going to improve that and hopefully open up additional affordable housing. But th these are governmental type housings. Part of the affordable housing problem that we have is just rents, private market rents are getting so high that they're forcing people out of housing into places like needing Western Heights and other KCDC housing. So it's a, a really a, a difficult issue to solve without bringing in the private market, those rents that are getting to be so sky high that people, you know, are having to pay 50, 60 percent of their uh, monthly salary to go toward housing, which is unsustainable. Michael. Well, um, I, I love the mayor's effort to uh, to create more affordable housing. I think the problem will be down the road when the price of those affordable residences goes up. Um, the value, the property values are going to go up. The rents are going to go up. The uh, sale prices for some of the homes that are on the market for sale as affordable housing, all of those, all of those metrics will change, and they will change upward. And so I think that there's going to come a time when we have more residences that people cannot afford to live in, and that will create its own problem. But but I, I applaud the effort. All right. Well, on that, we're going to wrap things up. I guess they have 3,800 uh, building permits waiting to be processed. They're going to have to hire people, they, the mayor said, to just to get through that. So a lot going on in the city of Knoxville, that's for sure, and Knox County. I want to thank our pundits for being here, Michael, Shelley, and Craig, for taking the time and sharing their opinions with us. And we want to thank you for watching Tennessee This Week. 
views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own and do not represent the views of WATE6 on your side or Next Star Broadcasting.